I'm going to start my slide presentation so I can kind of go through this. And we're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. So um, just a couple of little couple of things about me. I have two practices. I practice in Red Bank, New Jersey, and I also have a, a practice on Central Park South uh, in New York City. And I've had these practices my entire career. I have no disclosures, no financial disclosures or any other disclosures. I try to keep it very clean. There's a lot of people who like to get in bed with industry, and I find that a little reprehensible sometimes. So. Uh, a little bit about the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. We're the world's largest plastic surgery association. We have about 12,000. Plastic surgery is a small little community. We have about 12,000 members worldwide, and we represent 94% of the board-certified plastic surgeons within the country. If you look here, we have about 6,100, 6,164 6, board-certified plastic surgeons. The bottom number, the 1,559, are the number of residents that we have. Uh, I'm sorry, the 3,003 and 3,306 are our international members. So we have about 60 countries that are members of our organization. And one of the great things that I've had to do over the course of my year as president is go to many of these countries and represent plastic surgery. So private practitioners, this is just looking, you know, California, Texas, Florida, and New York, whenever you see statistics on plastic surgery, this is where they all come from. This is where most of the concentration um, uh, of plastic surgery is. If you look at pra practice demographics, about 24% of us are actually in 100% cosmetic practice, and you can just kind of see the breakdown here. So, so still, most people do a little bit of everything. Uh, about 25%, we're going to see that number move up, especially as the economics of medicine keep changing. Member engagement, this is what I'm really proud of, especially being president of this organization. We have so many different things available to you as medical students. We really make a point of trying to get our, our students engaged and get them involved in plastic surgery. It's all free to you. It's just resources to you. So if you look here, we have our medical students forum. We have last year at our national meeting, we had 500 medical students attend our meeting. You come for free, or maybe it's $50, and you definitely find all the food and the alcohol, I can tell you that. So, but we have plenty of opportunities for mentorship. If you look at the Propel program, that's one of our mentor, we put together mentor teams for you where you have the opportunity to be with residents, fellows, attendings, Throughout the world, we don't concentrate it just on people within this country. So again, these are all things that are free for you, and I'm going to go over a lot of the things that you can get involved with. So these are some of the places I call that I've personally DO'd. I've been in every continent other than, other than uh, um, what do you call, Antarctica, um, as far as lecturing and representing with my title DOFACS. So, it's kind of been nice because everybody not only knows about the school I graduated from, but they know about my degree, and I'm very proud of that. Residency training in the United States. This is something that I want to talk about. I'm not talking on behalf of any of these organizations. The ACGME is the American Council of Graduate Medical Education. This, these are the people who approve all your training programs. ABPS is the American Board of Plastic Surgery. These are the people who certify us as plastic surgeons. And then ACAPS is the American Council of Academic Plastic, a consortium of academic plastic surgeons. This is the group that oversees all the residency programs. So if you look at plastic surgery training across the globe, it varies by country. Board certifications are very different. You know, we're very spoiled in this country because we have a very standardized process. If you look at board certification in other countries, Central America, South America, Asia, the certification process is very different if it exists at all. So that's why we're kind of the gold standard for a lot of training and certification throughout the globe. If you look at this, this is an interesting slide. It just looks at the average age at the entrance of residency training. So on average, it's about 25, 26 years old, which is what um, we expect. But this is just specific to plastic surgery. In the United States, the average resident is starting their plastic surgery training at 26 years old. Then you look at the duration of plastic surgery training. In the UK, it's the longest. They kind of do a little more apprenticeship type training. But in the United States, on average, it's about six years of training. 
than duty hours. Duty hours are obviously something that we all comply to now. There was no duty hour training when I was in, in residency, but due to something called the first trial and the second trial, we know that we can't go past 80 hours a week. If you look at the United States, we kind of limit it to the 80 hours a week, and then you look at Italy, they work a little bit. They work about 30-something hours a week as far as training goes, whatever. It's, it, it kind of has the expectations, and you know we kind of think and we kind of know how those charts go. So. Domestic plastic surgery resident, though, I think that this is what I really want to talk to you, the accreditation process. And this is just an overview of the, just residency in general. There are three organizations, basically, four kind of. LCME, this is what your, qualifies your school. This is the oversight for, your, for all medical schools in the country. Then the ACGME, you look at the actual residency programs. The ACGME and ACAPS, as far as plastic surgery. So those are the people that, that are responsible for certifying and making sure that the programs meet all the required standards and the ACAPS is responsible for the curriculum and your learning during that process. Then you graduate, then the ABPS, the board, then you go on to your board certification, and then you have your membership organizations like ASPS, which I'm a part of. So the ACGME and the RRC, I'm sorry, um, this is a residency review committee. These are the people that make sure they're doing everything right and they're not torturing you, they're not, you know, making you work 90 hours a week. These are the people you all get to report to if you're being abused by your program. ACAPs are the people who are responsible to, for the program directors, making sure that you're getting the right curriculum taught to you and that the learning objectives are being met as far as the program goes. The American Board of Plastic Surgery is responsible for public safety, making sure that you're board certified. And then ASPS and the Aesthetic Society, these are membership organizations that assure continued education. So the pathways, so you can match during medical school. These are what we call integrated plastic surgery programs. These are six years of postgraduate training um, and includes rotations, all the required rotations, which we'll go over just quickly. You don't need to know, you know, for the sake of today, but it's arranged by a program director, just like any other residency programs. Independent programs, you have to complete general surgery training, ENT, ortho, neurosurgery, sufficient to achieve certification in that specialty for independent. So there are basically two pathways. When I trained or when I went into plastic surgery, the integrated model was very rare. A few programs are integrated, but most of us had to do some type of full surgical training before we could apply to plastic surgery. That's very expensive because the federal government pays for your training. They don't want to pay that much. So what we've done is we've kind of combined these just like with vascular surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and all the other programs. So now these are six-year programs for the most part, and you apply right out of medical school. The problem, it's very competitive, and there's ways to kind of, in, kind of increase your chances. So with plastic surgery, we have a separate matching, something called the San Francisco, different than the normal match process that you, that you normally do. Let me go back one slide. I'm sorry. The San Francisco match process. So um, the independent process is three years of progressive plastic surgery training, and then you have to ent enter your logs, your plastic surgery operative logs. So here's the different residency programs. There's the independent programs, meaning that these are the ones that exist for you after you complete your surgical training, which is well, most of the osteopathic students have to enter in because the integrated process is a little um, difficult, and we'll go over some of the stats. The integrated programs, there are 76 programs. So there's independent uh, residents in general. There's 369 as of this date. And integrated residents, there are 969. So there's not a lot. There's 1,200 plastic surgery students in the country. That includes all six years of training. So the matching process, through, if you're an independent, meaning you're going to complete general surgery first, you go through what we call a San Francisco match. And if you're going through medical school, you're going to go through NRMP just like you would any other process. So this is something you're all familiar with, AAMC. This is how you apply. You use a standardized application. And this is the one thing that we, as program directors, we go through the, and we read you know, your application and everything. So it's very easy. The training requirements to plastic surgery, you have to graduate either from an accredited medical school, uh, a residency, or a Royal College of Surgeons in the U.S. Uh, in Canada, okay? So residency training has to be accredited by one of these two organizations in order to be board cer certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. So the ACGME, this is responsible for all postgraduate training. So it's a single process now. So 
So any a residency that you go into will be accredited by the ACGME. So 28 residency review committees. These are the people who come and look at the program to make sure that they're doing everything right. So your training, they guarantee that your training is in fact on par and standardized with the rest of the country's training. So the ACGME accreditation, again, these are all the things that you, know, you don't really have to concern yourself with right now, but there's a lot of oversight to make sure. And when you guys are applying to programs, there's a couple of things that you have to know. You have to go onto the ACGME site, and there's a couple of things that you should be looking for, making sure that your program is, in fact, still accredited, the ones that you're applying to, and that they have continued accreditation. So when you go, you're going to put in, pick a, pick a program, and you're going to see this continued accreditation. It's how you know that whatever program you guys are thinking about applying for for residency, they're compliant, that they're making sure that, you know, that every year we have to submit this big, long form and everything that we're doing, including academic output, our scholarly activity of our attendings, making sure that people are doing research or residents are publishing. There's a lot of different things, duty hours, you name it. So you should see continued accreditation. Initial accreditation is going to be for those new programs that they can't give them continued accreditation yet. But if you see continued accreditation with warning, then there's something up. It may not be a big deal. About 55% of all programs are cited for duty hour violations now, 55%. So, you know, again, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't go. But when you see probationary status or withdrawn, you have to be obviously concerned. So, again, the ACGME, there's all this public data available to all of you who are applying to residency programs. So. The RRC, there's 10 members from ACS, the American Medical Association, American Board of Plastic Surgery. These are the people that come in and do the reviews. It doesn't matter to you guys. As program directors, we hate these people. <laughs> so anyway, the integrated programs, you're going to do general surgery. You're going to do about two years of general surgical training, all the clinical requirements, not that it's, you know, we have to go through it here, but everything from burn, anesthesia, you're going to do general surgery, you're going to do alimentary tract, because as a plastic surgeon, you're all over the body. You operate from head to toe. You may be taking a piece of small bowel to rebuild an esophagus, whatever you're doing. So we have to have good general surgical training. So as far as the cur curriculum goes, again, this is just... Uh, That happened here. Okay, so as far as the curriculum goes, you can kind of see right here, uh, at the end of the day, we wind up taking two exams, just like most of us, most of you, we have a, a, a board exam, a written exam, and then once you pass that, which is called the qualifying exam, you go on to take your, your, board, your oral exam, okay, which is your certifying exam. So, and this happens over about a one-year process, and then every 10 years, we have to kind of maintain. The AC, um, the American uh, Council of Academic Plastic Surgeons, or ACAPS, these are the people who are responsible for the oversight of all of the plastic surgery programs. And this is what every single one of you have to join if you're interested in plastic surgery. It's 100% free, and there's a huge amount of resources available for all of you, from mentorship to everything from guidebooks in order to tell you to optimize your chances of becoming a plastic surgeon. We have mentorship opportunities here. And one of the things that I've done since I've been president is reach out to the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons, their leadership, put them in front of the board of ACAPS in order to every, for everybody to understand what the issue is and why we're not seeing as many DOs in plastic surgery as we should. So we've started a DEI initiative, including the osteopathic medical schools for underrepresented institutions because you guys are not affiliated with plastic surgery programs. So we've started our series of webinars. So please join and get involved with this. So we have all of this is up and running now. So there's opportunity there. Now's the time for all of you to get involved as first and second year medical students because you got a lot of work to do if this is a field you're interested in or any competitive field because, again, you look at the application pool and everybody's doing, you know, practically have textbooks written by the time they're applying. I would never get into plastic surgery again. So, all right. So, let's go back. So, our curriculum, one to three years, again, just a bunch of the stuff that we go through. Um, the RRC, again, this is recommended. They're not required. Uh, the curriculum, uh, again, 
this is not necessarily that important. I want to talk about some other stuff. Our plastic surgery curriculum goals and objectives. Again, we have competencies, just like you're tested on competencies now. Same thing, it's no different. So again, these are some of the things, the core competencies. And then our uh, examples, like if you're doing an anesthesia rotation, we tell you what are the goals and objectives and you have to kind of meet those different things. And now that we have these EPAs or these um, entrustable professional activities when you're a resident, we have to prove that you're actually competent at what we're trying to teach you and we have more quantifiable ways of doing that. So residency training, you have to do 48 weeks per year, no matter how that average is out. So if you have a time, you're out, you're sick or whatever, you know, for exceptions, you have to somehow have completed 48 weeks of training per year in order to graduate. So the RRC is responsible for that time and competency part and ACAPS, which is the, is, uh, the academic plastic surgery organization is required uh, to make sure they regulate the content of what you're learning. These are just some of the milestones as a resident, you're gonna be, get these every six months and we're gonna kind of track your progress. So operative logs, okay, most of you, if you go into surgical residency, you have to track your cases. This is a standard operative log. Again, it just keeps track of what you're doing. Once you meet the green, you've met all your requirements for your residency. It usually takes, depending on what you're doing, between three to five years to meet all these. So. Resident training, aesthetics with plastic surgery. Believe it or not, it's one of the most difficult things for us to teach you in plastic surgery training. So it's not consistent throughout the United States. A lot of programs have resident clinics where we actually discount either the, the where we actually discount uh, the procedures or what happens is the companies will donate Botox and filler and all that other stuff and you guys get to you know do this at a discounted rate uh, with your own patients. So again, it depends on the particular institution. The journey, you want to be board certified. When no matter what you do, when no matter what profession you go into, your board certification matters, so you have to make sure that you get board certified. So the American Board of Plastic Surgery, this started in 1938, and this is something that's been around, and this is how we board certify our members. And this, again, the public, I don't know. I mean, I think Instagram is probably more important to most people than, you know, the number of followers or likes you get seems to equate to your competency days versus actual board certification. So this is created for standards and minimums, okay? So all boards, they have to, it confers the minimum amount of training necessary. It doesn't necessarily equate to competence, but at least it's something. It's, there's an ethical code and things that you have to kind of attest to every single year. The goal is to protect the public and make sure that you're competent in what you're saying you're competent in. We've spent many years in front in DC. One of the things that my role in my organization, uh, plastic surgery, is I was very involved with health policy and advocacy. So I go to Washington, DC a lot and advocate for lots of different things, including increasing the number of graduate medical education spots for all of you to make sure we can get more residency spots, making sure that some nurse practitioner or some PA isn't out there who has a, you know, every single nurse anesthetist now confers a degree of a PhD. So every nurse anesthetist is now a doctor, technically. So there's a lot of people trying to take your jobs away from you. So the advocacy portion of my job is incredibly important to me. And these are all the things that, you know, I don't want to scare you away or anything like that, but staying involved and making sure that you protect the right for you to practice and do your training. You guys are doing it the right way. A lot of people are taking shortcuts and it's frustrating. So, all right, operative cases, don't worry about that. Okay, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, my organization that I'm incredibly proud of. The mission of us is to support its members in their efforts to provide the highest quality patient care and maintain professional and ethical standards through education, research, advocacy, and socioeconomic and other professional activities. We have a foundation, so we give away research money as well. So there's a lot of things that we do throughout the world to promote, and we have an entire program. We're training microsurgeons in Africa through Zoom. We, got, we have a couple of surgeons that go down about every four weeks. We've graduated two classes already <clears throat> where because there's, there's obviously a dearth of training in Sub-Saharan Africa, so people who are interested, we have people throughout the country who go, they volunteer, they do two-week missions down in Africa, we train them on chicken thighs, and all of a sudden, you know, they become proficient in microsurgery. We got a great picture the other day, someone, I was at a California meeting, California Society of Plastic Surgeons, and one of my colleagues just got back from Africa, then she did some Zoom training as well, and some one of her surgeons that she trained sends a big machete injury to the arm, arm hanging off, 
and the arm lived, sends the video of everything working because of the training. So this is something called the SHARE program. So again, it's a lot of great things that we get to do through our foundation. Um, okay, the road to plastic surgery. So osteopathic road to plastic surgery. And I think this is something, I teach this, I kind of do this. Medical Students Day is coming up. It's in September. Our national meeting, our national scientific meeting is in October. And September sometime, I don't remember the exact date, but we have a um, the osteopathic road to plastic surgery where some of my residents um, uh, who are in plastic surgery residencies and some of our, our DO plastic surgeons will um, teach this. So here, single GME accreditation occurred in 2015. What that means is basically there used to be osteopathic training, there used to be the allopathic training. It's now one program. So if you're getting into a plastic surgery program, it's accredited by the ACGME and that's it. So more opportunities, more choices. You don't have two separate application processes and consistent competency and milestone measurements. So again, it just kind of unified the process. The two pathways I just went over, you have the traditional route, which requires prerequisite training, or the integrated program, which is a six-year training. So how competitive do I need to be to match into plastic surgery? Do I need the Comlex or the USMLE? Are most programs DO friendly? And one of my biggest fears of arriving at a rotation just to find out the faculty are not willing to give me a fair shot, end up in a lukewarm uh, letter or no letter. When you do a rotation, you're auditioning. When you guys rotate, it doesn't matter where you are, you're auditioning every single day. So get that stuff out of your head, okay? If you're competent, then you're competent. End of story, okay? So that's one of the biggest things that you all have to overcome. When you go, if you're doing an outside rotation because you really want to be somewhere, you want to do something, you're auditioning every day you're there. Just remember that. How much research do I need to do? I don't know the answer to that. You know, we have so many people who are so incredibly competent. They have so many publications and they still don't match. So again, these are very difficult questions. Should I try to get involved with research? Yes, yes, yes. Again, we're trying to open up every opportunity for you and we'll talk about some of the things and I'm always available to talk to you. But yes, you have to get involved. You have to do something because everybody is trying to build a resume in order to get recognized. Our away rotations for sub-internships, important, incredibly important. There was a recent article that came out in JAMA that kind of looked at the number of residents that matched after they rotated through whatever particular rota rotation specialty. So you increase your chances. Remember, there's no more scores. There's no more grades. How do we know who you are? You know, so again, it's a little bit difficult. You know, I think all of us kind of just shake our heads a little bit as program directors because it's very difficult for us to have anything quantifiable, even though it's probably a good thing that the grades went away on the USMLE or a Comlex, whatever. Um, it makes it difficult because everybody looks the same on paper now. So, and a lot of the letters don't mean anything. And your, your, your personal statements, if I can say one thing, make them interesting, okay? They're so boring, okay? Your personal statements are boring as hell. And if I read one more personal statement about the first time I was awed because I watched the heartbeat, who cares, okay? Who cares? We're all surgeons, okay? There's something that makes you stand apart. I take maybe two or three personal statements every year out of the 150 that I'm forced to read every single year that are actually worth reading, okay? The rest of them are boring as hell, okay? So it's an opportunity. Make your personal statement interesting. Let us know why you're different than every other boring person applying, okay? Make your personal statement interesting. And don't just give it to one person to read. Give it to a lot of people and be very open to criticism, okay? All right, so these are two publications that are coming out. These are not out yet. They've both been accepted for presentations at meetings that these are two different groups that I work with. So one, the first group, the, the discrepancies among osteopathic applicant match rates for integrated plastic surgery residency. This was done by a medical student. She was amazing. The amount of work that she put into this, then I wound up adding a lot of information, got a lot of information extracted from the San Francisco match for her. Um, but we have a bunch of different people involved in this. Um, so, and I'm gonna go over some of the uh, statistics with this. And then the other one, the osteopathic medical students, perception of plastic surgery. This was done by a combination of people from North, we have people at Northwestern, people from downstate. We have allopathic, osteopathic students all working on this. So um, again, a really interesting mix of people. Um, and I'll talk about these in a second. So the second 
uh, uh, is being presented at the um, uh, American College of Osteopathic Surgeons in the fall, uh, next month. And the other one is being presented at the end of the month at the um, uh, at my meeting, the, uh, the uh, American Society of Plastic Surgeons scientific meeting. So, so osteopathic student data for plastic surgery. So this is, we did a program director study and they seldom or never interview DO candidates. You know, we asked why. So they recommended that um, USMLE scores need to be increased, even though the average was at least 240, okay? So research productivity, we know that this is one of the issues that a lot of uh, osteopathic students have. You don't have affiliated labs to work with, so that's something that we're working on. Lack of affiliated programs, meaning that you don't have a plastic surgery program here, so how can we get you involved? So, so the action, like I mentioned already, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, the AAPS, which is the American Association of Plastic Surgeons, these are all the old white guys, okay? That's the, that's the association. I'm not even a member of them, okay? But they're the old research people. They're the old guard, okay? They're the people who would never, ever, ever let half the people into residency programs. And when I said, I want the osteopathic outreach done, they were the first people that said, absolutely. So <laughs> I don't know what that's about, but it's great news and I'm happy about it. So we've signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with AAPS, with a a ASPS, my organization and ACAPS. So there's now this whole outreach program that's starting to occur. This is its initial launch this year. It's been active for about six months. So you'll be hearing more from it and we'll get you all more connected. Okay, so again, great news for us. Uh, DOs represent approximately 25% of the matriculating medical students in the United States. However, acceptance into plastic uh, surgery training programs remains low. Only 13 DO medical students have successfully matched into integrated plastic surgery programs since 2010. That's horrible, okay? So we know that from 2010 to 2022, only 0.7% of all integrated plastic surgery positions were filled by DO candidates compared to 3.5 by IMGs and 95.1% uh, by MD students. So since 2020, 95.3% of the DO senior applicants failed to match in integrated plastic surgery. DOs compromised th uh, comprised 39 of the San Francisco matches compared to only uh, 12 or 0.8% of the integrated. So it's still, the, 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 the ability for you to match is still higher or greater with the individual or the, with the um, independent training programs, okay? So in the past 10 years, 76% of the DOs matched into independent programs, while 24% matched into integrated programs. So of the eight um, integrated programs that are currently training at least one DO resident, 87% of these are either in the central or southern regions of the country, not a whole lot in the northeast. This is just what it looks like. So if you look here, this is just kind of a pictogram of what our, or pie chart of what I'm saying. Only 0.7% of those were DOs where 95.1%, and there were still unfilled positions, okay? So this is my job where i am been working on trying to get this a little, we gotta get this number up. So again, that's something that, that's a long-term goal of mine, okay? And then this is just kind of looking at everyone overall, the number of applicants to the number of matches. So that's the number of DO applicants to the number of actual matches, the number of MDs, IMGs, so again, you can see that there's still unfilled positions even with this. Lastly, my scientific meeting, this is the big meeting that I preside over every year as president, your end of year is your final meeting, that's your big send off into you know, irrelevance. So I invite you all to Austin, okay, for many different reasons. Number one, there's the registration fee is like 25 or 50 bucks, but every single program director will be there. Every single program director of every single plastic surgery program in this country will be at this meeting, okay? There's lots of opportunity for you to meet and greet, get in front of people. This is where it starts. You have to know every local regional meeting if this is something you're really interested in. There's a meeting in DC happening in a couple of weeks called the Northeastern Society of Plastic Surgeons. There's the New Jersey Society meetings. Put together an abstract, just submit it, okay? You're gonna get it accepted, okay? Because not a lot of people submit stuff, so they're gonna accept your abstract. It's an opportunity for you to start 
the process and start meeting the people. You have a program down the road over here. So again, these are all opportunities for you. We can talk about them individually, but there's a process and there's a pattern that we know that works for the most part. However, you know, again, all opportunities for you. So, and lastly, this is just all my contact information. If any of you, my email, my phone numbers, everything is in there. I'm happy to talk to any of you about this. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of close it now for questions and answers. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Greco. We're gonna make sure everyone who uh, asks a question uses this mic. So um, I'm gonna ask for questions in a second, but first we're gonna take a question from the Sewell campus, Brittany. So we actually have two questions from the Sewell campus. Uh, the first one um, being, I see that you do use 3D imaging to help your patients visualize results. Do you see a role for computer-aided instruments like robotic MIS in your practice? And do you see them as beneficial to patient outcomes? Um, so there's a lot of uh, computer-generated programs that we use in plastic surgery. I personally use several of them. I don't do any robotic surgery. Robotic surgery is always one of those things that I think that we, we look for indications, you know, of the robot to make up for the surgery. So, but there's a couple of people doing really amazing microsurgical dissections with the robot. So again, there's an indication, but we use 3D software. So patients want to know what their nose is going to look like. They want to know what their breasts are going to look like. It's good. You're setting expectations, you know, being in the operating room and doing something in front of a computer screen are very different things. But there's a lot of interesting things happening, especially with AI now, you know, so AI is really kind of jumping into plastic surgery. Um, but yes, computer generated everything. Robotics are really interesting. Um, so yes, it's a huge field. It's a giant question. But yes, I do use 3D software, it's helpful, but there's a disclaimer at the end of every piece of 3D, you know, that we send to the patient because they just get and they can go play and they can put different size implants in and do all that stuff. So, um, but it doesn't represent their actual result. One okay, more. now we'll take questions from this room, anybody? Okay. Yes, we'll stand up. Hi, Hi. Ooh, too loud. Hi, I'm Gabriana Andrews. Um, I guess my question is, I know that you said that you didn't have like a specific number or things that you need that you say for research. Um, last year, the average integrated plastic um, person who matched had an average of 28 publications or 28.4, I think was the exact number. But do you personally think that like passion projects in research are more important or would you rather see numbers of abstracts and publications being accepted? Yeah. You know, it's a great question. So the question is whether or not passion projects or the number of publications are important in order to match. It's always a big head scratcher because although we want to see that someone is productive in plastic surgery, having 28 publications just means you maybe spend time in a lab or you're good at writing papers. It doesn't mean that you're going to be a good plastic surgeon. So, so sometimes it's very difficult. I think you have to have some publications and you have to be collaborating, but I think you have to, you know, it's more than just that. So as far as scholarly activity, you need to have scholarly activity. There's no way anyone's getting an interview without something. So, but 28 publications, I have a prelim intern right now with me and my program. She was in one of my friend's lab up at Harvard for two years, put out multiple publications. She's incredibly bright, 270s on the USMLE. She didn't match. I have no idea why, because she's actually really a good doctor and she's nice and she's normal, okay? So <laughs> I don't know why she didn't match. So it's really hard to say. So it's just one of the things, it's a numbers game, but it's a little bit of a degree game here too. So one of the things, it's about competency. So when you're places, you have to prove your competency. And then second part to the question is when it comes to gen surge residency, do you like seeing um, research years from your students? I, I know that not everyone does one, mm -hmm. um, but with USMLE going to pass fail or the first one, it is growing in popularity. So I guess I just want to know your opinion on that. 
Yes, I think you have to set yourself apart. At the end of the day, you have to set yourself apart as an applicant because the applicant pool, everybody looks the same. Everybody looks competent on paper. So you need something to set yourself apart. I don't think for me when I'm going through, I don't care if someone published 10 papers or five papers, as long as they did something, it looks like they did something. Your letters mean a lot. So your letters of recommendation are helpful. Um, you know, the, we can kind of read through letters of recommendation and understand the people, the letter writers, a lot of them, they don't even change the name of the person they wrote the name. You know, there's a lot of weird things that happen with letters, but letters are very helpful. Um, and you got to rotate, you know, try to rotate at the places you're interested. Don't just pick a rotation just because, oh, I think it's cool there. I think it's a cool campus. Go places where you know you have a possibility of matching. Okay. You have to be very, very, and you guys have to start now. I didn't have to do any of this. It was very different. It was just very different, you know? So you guys have to start, it's a long game now. So you have to start this thinking right now. So yeah, I mean, it's planning process now. So, but yes, I think research at the end of the day is important in some way, shape or form. Do something you like, do something you know you're gonna finish. You're gonna go run gels, who cares? Right? So if you're not, if you like doing it, great, go get in a lab and do it. Be productive though, try to do something. Yet another question from the other campus. Uh, so our additional question from Sewell is, what is the best way to connect with the ASPS mentorship program? Uh, just oh, what you do is you have to go and sign up as a student member. So sign up as a student member, and then all the resources are there. Just go to plasticsurgery.org and all the resources are there to sign up and then also you can email me and i can kind of make some connections too so any other questions i do Th thank you <laughs> for that that great lecture i had a question was uh, your dei initiative started with grants and research initiatives and uh is vasculars in the same boat as plastics how long do you think the initiative will take uh, to work to allow DOs to follow a pathway to residency rather than fellowship? Uh, you know, we're, so we're, okay, we're already doing it. So we've already initiated it. We've started because under me, so when I, I brought this to them, I did it, I did it in the fall. So I got my vice president of membership and I got all of my, fortunately, thank God, I have a staff of 150 people that I get the call on if I need something done because we're a big organization. We have a big staff. So when is it when does it translate to actually seeing more people that's a great question and that's one of the things that you know i put together a bunch of groups throughout the country of medical students osteopathic medical students osteopathic um, attendings in order to kind of help this process so because i think that this is just nothing more than this is kind of a grassroots outreach to programs and making sure everything everyone understands one of the great things is the fact that every single plastic surgeon in our membership organization, 12,000 people throughout the world has to put up with my DOFACS every single day in their inbox, okay? So that's out there and that's helpful. I will tell you that right now, but I think we have to quantify that because we have to see more than 0.7%. There's a lot of really great applicants in our osteopathic schools. 25% of you make up the, physician, the, the students in the country. So again, our job is to make sure we get you qualified, meaning get you that research, get you those opportunities, and making sure that the, the programs, when you apply for rotations, that they accept you. So that's my next goal, is to work with ACAPS, making sure, because there's a separate way for you to apply to, to resident, to, I'm sorry, to uh, sub eyes. so we have to make sure that you have an inroad there. We're just going to do a couple more, if that's okay? Sure. All right. We have Sul. Will Robert Wood Johnson be adding additional surgical residencies? Uh, as far as surgical residencies, we have, we currently have seven. We just expanded within the last six months to 12 residents. So we just expanded our complement uh, uh, within the last six months. So the answer is yes. Um, so uh, as far as next year's pool, we'll be interviewing for 12 spots. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, my name is Amir. Uh, I'm currently a fourth year. So what kind of recommendations would you have for someone um, going through like a general surgery residency looking to fellowship? Because even though your initiative is to get more DOs into an integrated program based on last year's numbers, yeah. it's not looking. Correct. 
Yeah, I think I think your best bet still is still doing traditional, doing your general surgical residency. But the thing is that when you start your general surgical residency, that's where you have to start. Your production has to start there. So because it's still, fortunately, the mindset with the traditional programs is different. So I think that it's still the the, the opportunity for you. And remember the one good thing and the one the way I kind of faced it, you know, my plan B was I was still going to be a general surgeon. So I still had the opportunity. I, it was so um, but you have to start being productive then. So start with your local meetings, okay? And when you're geographically thinking about where you wanna do general surgery, think about proximity to plastic surgery programs and how, and keep it quiet because general surgeons hate plastic surgeons, especially when their residents go into plastic surgery, they hate it. So, um, but you don't have to keep it quiet, but what you, you're gonna do is, you know, all my, all my Robert Wood Johnson residents that are interested in plastic surgery, we work on finding them labs to get into, to go do research during their years. And then I have so many different projects. I just finished four textbook chapters with a bunch of different residents. And then, you know, we have a bunch of publications that we're working on together. So it's great for me because if it was up to me, I'd never do anything because I don't have the time. So, so it's great for them because they need the production, they need the academic output, the, the scholarly activity. So, so it's really helpful from that standpoint. So, so wherever you wind up, you have to be productive. And again, it's, we can have the conversation at another time, but we can talk, okay? We have another question from our Seoul campus. Are independent programs converting to integrated or do you think they will remain independent with the example of St. Joe's? Yeah, I, I don't think there, it, you know, if you actually look at the number, you know, we haven't really lost a lot of integrated spots because some of the integrated spots have increased. So even though everybody thinks they're all going away, they're not, they've kind of stayed about the same. So, so I think that we're going to wind up keeping them because we still need the inroad for people who want are interested in plastic surgery. So, so I don't think they're going to go away um, anytime soon. It's just that the academic institutions that, that support the, this, this type of training model, they do get paid less from the federal government when you apply to them. So, I mean, usually that's not your problem, that's the institution's problem, but that's not the reason they're going away. So, so we haven't seen this, this, this horrible decline in them, fortunately. Uh, one final question, anybody in Stratford here? Uh, sure. Uh, same folks, all right. So as a program director and an assistant program director, um, you've said like a lot of personal statements can be boring and like letters are great and everything, but what's something for you when you're reviewing applications that you can like remember that you're like, wow, this really stood out to me? You know, the, first off, we want to understand who you are. And the problem is a lot of your applications, we don't get a sense of who you are. So, you know, you have to kind of let us understand some of the things you've done in your life and some how why you're you so that's what we're interested in it's not the same kind of just so so what sets you apart why are you going to be a better resident why are you going to be a better general surgeon what have you done everybody likes seeing leadership um type of experience so because leadership stuff especially you know general surgery is a really hard residency right most residencies are hard general surgery is hard so we want to know that you know you're also kind of like they love seeing the fact that you played organized sports they love military background stuff and i'm just speaking in generalities they like to know that you were part of an organized process okay so not that you have to go join you know the reserve but it's just something that, you know, those are the things, but things that make you unique, work experience, you know, what have you done? You know, if there's something that, you know, something in your personal statement about, you know, a challenge or what, what, what did you overcome? Why are you here? You know, those are the things that I want to say again, a lot of you look the same. You're really qualified people because remember to, to, for me to see your application, you went through an entire computer sort already. Okay. So that's one of the things. So, so now that computer sort is going to be even harder, okay? Because there's no scores. Because we used to use some cutoff scores, which I hate. That's why I personally went through, you know, all of the, the applications myself. So I have a lot of DOs in my program. Robert Wood never took DOs until I started, okay? Because they're like, no, we're not going to, whatever. So we have, we've, we've been taking plenty now. Every year we take DOs now. So, so apply to Robert Wood if you're interested, okay? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Greco. We're going to wrap up here. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. 
Um, Dr. Greco did say he would be available yeah. afterwards for any individual questions from to the group here. And of course, uh, you shared your information, so thank you. Um, you are most certainly the most interesting person on campus today. Uh, this is a great turnout for us, and we have uh, an equal amount of people in the Sewell campus uh, watching you uh, on the WebEx. Um, so thank you for the information about your, uh, your roadmap and the roadmap that they need to follow today, your advocacy to try and open some doors, and your advice for all of our students who are interested in, um, in following your, fo your footsteps. So we have a small token from the Alumni Association, just some, some gifts for Rowan Virtual SOM, and I want to thank you again. My pleasure. Thanks, thank sir. you, everyone.